welcome everyone this morning to this um, webinar uh, on behalf of the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges. My name is Mark Funkhauser and I'm a site manager. And uh, we have uh, a webinar this morning on utilizing technology for remote hearings during the pandemic. So I would like to remind everybody to keep your uh, video off. We're going to have the presenters on uh, present view. Uh, and you will also be on mute. We will um, allow the chat box to be open. So if you have any questions, we'll be monitoring that throughout the webinar. Um, I would like to introduce our um, presenters today. Uh, the Honorable Judge uh, Darlene Byrne is a presiding judge and past president of the National Council and also a significant leader uh, in around the country. And uh, also the Honorable um, Martinez, Judge Martinez Jones uh, also presides uh, in Travis County and is a board, uh, board director for the council and a leader in the field and in the state of Texas as well. This uh, webinar will be recorded for the purposes of providing a resource for those who could not attend. And now I will turn it over to our distinguished guests. Good afternoon, everybody. It is really great to see all your names collecting in this webinar, and it's an honor to co-present with Judge Martinez Jones today. Uh, we're gonna try to spend this time together um, with an opportunity to talk about um, the effect of this pandemic on our court system. And much of that effect has been, uh, at least from my point of view, Judge Martinez Jones, quite positive. Uh, I just got off a three hour Zoom hearing this morning and I'll be talking about some of the tools uh, that I have learned how to nimbly use um, to manage a courtroom, uh, and to advance justice for the children and families we serve. Uh, Judge Jones. Yes, I'm very excited to share with you all. I just finished about seven Zoom hearings. They were shorter this morning, but this is my docket day, and this is the day that I have all of our um, initial hearings with uh, parents in new cases over Zoom. So I'm looking forward to sharing what we've been learning uh, I think we've been remote since March 13th. I know I have it and, and that docket that I had that first day in Texas when they started closing things down. Um, and so we have gone through a lot of ups and downs and figuring through things. And so this is a great opportunity and I'm excited to be here to share. Great. So I, I think maybe we, uh, Judge Martinez-Jones and I have presented uh, in the past to our local uh, group of attorneys and CASAs and the like. And so she and I will be using somewhat the outline that we utilized in that presentation. And one of the first things to start with um, in launching off into this world is each of you are from different states and different jurisdictions and each of you locally are deploying um, your um, social distancing, your closing or opening back up of certain services in your community at different rates. Um, so for us to get started, we needed to understand what authority that our Texas Supreme Court, for Judge Martinez Jones and myself, what authority did the uh, Supreme Court justices provide us to assist us during this pandemic? What impact did our governor's uh, rulings have on our local court system? And then to the extent our mayor, our county commissioner's court, as well as my local uh, judges, what are all the orders that impact how I do business? And so, one of the first things to do in your toolkit is to be very aware of what new tools you have or what restrictions or limitations you have. For example, we have in, in my county, which is called Travis County here in Austin, we uh, just issued a joint uh, district judges uh, second amended order that is being responsive to our governor's um, uh, 
orders our uh, mayor and our county commissioners orders. And for example, in our jurisdiction, we are, uh, we have issued rulings uh, jointly as judges that we will have no in-person um, uh, hearings in our court until June, uh, no sooner than June 29th. And we will not have any jury trials any sooner than August 17th. And that uh, our order also advises those that read it um, that even at that time, much of our hearings, even post those dates, should be expected to occur in a format such as this, uh, utilizing in, in our state, we're using Zoom and YouTube. Um, and as I have shared with Judge Martinez Jones, just for the issue of social distancing related to our docket, uh, which are quite large, uh, we have approximately 1,500 kids, somewhere around 900 cases that are split between the two of us. Um, and if we did one day's docket down at our downtown courthouse, we would consume our entire old courthouse uh, with all the social distancing requirements. So we're not envisioning truly doing our child welfare docket um, at all for the rest of the year in any other format other than some type of blended electronic format. Um, our jury trials on this docket will likely go forward. We're trying to wrap our mind around that and installing plexiglass in our court rooms and, and a variety of things like that. But Judge Martinez Jones, any thoughts on the benefits of knowing your local orders and what new authority you have or restrictions you yeah, so when we started getting our orders and even locally as we crafted the orders for our courts, we all know that the child welfare courts are um, slightly different than the regular civil and family law courts. And we usually have a collective of uh, lawyers and advocates who are the same people who are working on those cases for the most part. So we know our community of child welfare professionals. What I have seen come to light as these orders come through is the importance of leadership from the bench and helping everyone understand what it really means for our particular cases that are the child welfare cases. Um, we had to initially make sure that there was clarity that just because there were not in-person hearings did not mean that hearings were canceled because there was uh, initial confusion on how to interpret those things. And then specifically how we were gonna continue to move forward um, in considering that we weren't having things in person, we were being remote, and that these cases do require a lot of hands-on, um, if you say, advocacy and activity with all the professionals involved. So I know that the um, child welfare professionals in our community have really appreciated the kind of communication that myself and Judge Byrne have been doing and letting them know what's going on and what to expect. I think we all try and be trauma-informed and kind of knowing what to expect as part of that and letting people um, have a heads up about the next steps, what we're thinking, and even as Judge Byrne said, the possibility that we might not be back at the courthouse for the rest of the year. Those are things that we make sure we're communicating effectively with all of the stakeholders and the professionals in the community, and I think that's very key and important for things to run smoothly, especially as we move into the way we're handling things remotely. We have a uh, continue to communicate with those stakeholders throughout this process. Anytime there's a change in the process because we're learning as we go, we make sure to communicate those things to them. And I think that communication has been key for the success that we've seen with efficiency and continuing to move forward. So I just encourage everybody to really hold on to that title of a leader um, because now more than ever, we really are leaders in the community as we move forward to this new process that people are not used to and has not really been done in this way before. Absolutely, Judge. I think that you uh, you uh, put your finger on the pulse of, I think, what um, NCJ, FCJ has taught us so well is our powers to convene, our um, powers to lead um, is needed more now than ever. Uh, we are still bringing our uh, core stakeholder groups together on a regular basis via Zoom. The model court hearings of our executive committee are occurring. We are collaborating with them. We are troubleshooting with them about any new deployed 
system that we roll out on how to handle matters now more electronically. Uh, but the one message that I think has uh, come clear to our um, community of stakeholders is we consider this docket of uh, families and children essential. They cannot wait. Justice cannot be delayed for them. And it is our obligation to meet their essential need now more than ever. They need access to the courthouse now more than ever. And we have to figure out a way to make that happen. I have uh, provided to NCJFCJ numerous of our written protocols that we have issued and uh, those are free to be shared with anyone on this webinar or anyone that asks NCJFCJ for those protocols. And we'll be talking about some of those today. In addition, yesterday, in light of uh, what I'm learning as it relates to doing a full day contested Zoom hearing or a multi-day contested Zoom hearing, and some of the efforts at controlling and keeping courtroom decorum during those hearings, um, I've learned quite a bit on how to make that happen, but also try to protect due process rights and allowing uh, the children and parents to have a voice in those proceedings. So I issued a brand new order yesterday um, in a real complex case that I've coming up on Friday involving uh, two deaf parents, one in California, one here, numerous deaf interpreters. It will take all day. Um, and so I think when you uh, provide written protocols in advance so that people know what to expect, know how to behave in your virtual courtroom, uh, that's uh, so much more helpful. Um, and unless Judge Martinez Jones has anything more on that, and I, I know that we are about, um, if we're delaying our courts now, the big concern we are seeing in our local jurisdiction, and I envision you are as well, is we are seeing child welfare cases uh, take a nosedive. In essence, the reports to the uh, hotline on abuse and neglect is down as if we are in summer school or the summertime. So what I envision is if we're not handling the business of our court now and getting everything in order now, as soon as our children go back to school, your numbers in your jurisdiction are gonna skyrocket. And so I don't know when you're going back to school. I don't know when we're going back to school. But I know we will be going back to school. And our number one reporter of child abuse and neglect in our jurisdiction are the teachers. And so what I would encourage you to do is go ahead and leap off and start handling your docket now because there is going to come a time when we're going to have a real rise in our caseload. Judge Martinez Jones on that. Yeah, I wanted just to give a little context for anybody who wasn't aware. Um, Travis County is Austin, Texas, and the two judges who handle all the child welfare cases are myself and Judge Byrne. We have about a jurisdiction of 1.2 million in population and constantly growing, and we have uh, over 1,500 children involved in the child welfare system uh, here in Travis County, which is just under about 1,000 cases, and we've pretty much just split those cases down the middle. So for us, any given day, like like mine today and yesterday for Judge Byrne, we could have 25 to 35 hearings that need review per our Texas statute and uh, in compliance with all of the federal statutes. And we just could not see how delaying would help ourselves or our community in the future. And so just to give you that context, we are dealing with um, larger dockets and especially being just the two of us handling all of the cases in our jurisdiction. That's why it has been very important for us to find ways to continue moving forward. And in Texas, we are a jurisdiction that does allow for jury trials for uh, termination cases. And that has been that other piece that Judge Byrne said. We're still trying to wrap our minds around how we're going to do that within our deadlines that we have um, and without 
any additional idea how long the situation will last. We're doing our best with the authority that we have been given um, by our Texas Supreme Court, which has temporarily allowed us to suspend some of the deadlines, um, but we know that's not gonna last for, for very much longer, it seems. Um, so just a little context as to why it's been very important for us in our jurisdiction to continue moving those cases forward. And in that regard, uh, Judge, one of the things that we are keeping a close uh, handle on are any of the cases that we have, as, as you know, uh, and as Judge Martinez Jones just mentioned, we do jury trials for termination of parental rights. We uh, recognize that requesting a jury trial can result in delay, especially with this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, even some of our longer hearings at the very beginning, uh, and for me, the beginning was March 23rd. We did a week ramp up of trying to get ready for March 23rd and writing our written protocols. But I started Zoom hearings uh, and the like immediately on March 23rd with the week prep to get all my protocols in order and shared with my collaborative team. But we recognized in our jurisdiction that although we have got the authority from our Texas Supreme Court to suspend statutory deadlines, and we do have that authority, um, termination of parental rights deadlines, um, uh, many of the emergency hearing deadlines, we have the authority to do that. But what does that mean to children and families? It may mean that a wrongful re removal occurred and a child is languishing in foster care. It may mean that a child in a forever home is languishing, waiting for the inevitable, in that particular case, termination of parental rights and therefore delaying their permanency. So with all of those issues, Judge Martinez Jones and I use that special authority that we've been given by the Texas Supreme Court to suspend deadlines in very, very rare cases. Because we realize we're kicking a can down the road and it's like a snake that consumes the rat. It's just, it's not like it's gone anywhere, it's still there and we're gonna have to deal with that delay at some point in time. So for example, right now, the delay uh, since March 23rd for me that I have on my docket is only three cases. I have three cases that are delayed in jury trial and there's not much I can do about that until we figure out how to do social distancing uh, to amass a jury of 12 individuals. Um, so our lawyers have been uh, given a lot of authority, they've been uh, trained very well over the years. They're really amazing litigants. Many of them are board certified in child welfare. Um, we have trusted our officers of the court and our guardian ad litems to reach agreements in as many hearings as we possibly can. We are blending numerous electronic tools to do this massive docket. We are blending a submission docket, which is literally a paper docket that is very little touched by Judge Martinez, Jones, and I because it's got certain protocols uh, for things to go through that docket. We also have an email docket, which is another form of submission where literally I'm on the email uh, string along with every lawyer and CASA in a case. We've done a lot of cases that way. Then we all also utilize Zoom. In any of those, we might combine many of those electronic tools in order to get to a resolution. And we can combine submitting written testimony via affidavit and the like. So we're utilizing every electronic tool we have in order to keep the docket moving. Anything on those thoughts, Judge Martinez-Jones? 
Yeah, so um, I think that we have had to, uh, in leadership, communicate to our child welfare professionals that we have to keep things moving forward and that we're going to be doing it through submissions and giving the um, uh, layout of what we have. Our um, submission docket that we've been using for a little while is based on agreements that really just need the court to sign off because all the parties have agreed. Um, the attorneys know how to use that and we've uh, told them to continue using that process to submit agreements to the court for our signature and we continue to utilize that. Um, we created separate email addresses to do the submission hearings and those um, have been helpful. We've done hundreds of cases that way. Um, they're not all agreements. There are uh, the opportunity for our lawyers to show their uh, legal writing skills and how persuasive they can be in their advocacy to the court. And they're literally doing their arguments written through email um, and advocating for whatever position they have that is not in agreement with whatever maybe another um, party is asking for. We have also allowed them to do certain um, affidavits that they're able to get from their clients so that the court can take a look at those affidavits and hear if there's any dispute to the um, allegations that are in affidavits and if we need to make specific findings about things. Um, that's been helpful as well. And the parties have really worked hard to making sure that if there is a true dispute, that's brought to the attention of the court. And it's not how we've seen in the past sometimes uh, in the advocacy, it's, it's adversarial just to be adversarial. We've seen less of that. And it's been very helpful for them, uh, I think as well, to be able to get past that level of advocacy and really get down to the root of the issues for their clients so that we are really moving things forward. I think the um, pandemic has changed some of the thought process in the advocacy from our lawyers and looking at what is most urgent and most important. And those are the things that they're bringing to us through the submissions. But I sit there and I go through the email chains and I look at everybody's um, argument and I take it all into consideration. If there are any statements that are needed to be considered for any fact finding, I take a look at those. If I have questions, I respond. If I need additional argument, if I need citation for something that they mentioned, the particular case, I do that through email. So we're still able to move it forward and this is simply through email. Um, the Zoom hearings now are, are different and we do have to set them. You all are on Zoom now and I think Judge Byrne and I are gonna go into some specifics about how Zoom works, but we really try and reserve the Zoom hearings for those things that are just either too complex too complicated or the disputes really do require us to have a conversation about it to be able to see each other or to take testimony this way. So we really also um, encourage our lawyers to be very specific as to any need particularly to be on Zoom because uh, as you'll hear from us as we talk about it this is not the simplest way. It is not an exact translation of being in person. And there are some complexities and um, some exhaustion that comes with doing Zoom hearings. And so uh, Judge Byrne, if you wanna start that conversation, I'll be happy to chime in. Thank you, Judge. I will, just to give you an idea of magnitude, since March 23rd, Judge Martinez Jones and I have presided over that email vessel that she was talking about, about 700 matters have been handled since March 23rd, utilizing just that tool. In the Zoom arena, doing Zoom hearings, we've done about 225 Zoom hearings between the two of us since March 23rd. We're still doing child visits also, Sometimes the child wants to visit with us separately from the hearing and we're doing that. You could actually use breakout rooms. Some of my, cl my child clients are appearing in the hearing and I had a child the other day, a 16 year old, give testimony in one of my contested hearings. So we're seeing a lot of young people appearing for their hearings. Judge Martinez Jones presides over our family treatment drug court. She has done seven weeks of our family treatment drug court. They do staffings. They've had 141 participant hearings since March 23rd. I'm doing my dual status docket as well. Right now, the juvenile justice side of things, the adjudications and dispositions have been deferred, but I am doing some of the 
modifications of conditions for release, as well as doing um, uh, their CPS, their child welfare uh, um, portion of the case. In addition, that other total electronic vessel that's separate than email and separate from Zoom is called our submission docket. And since that time, we've done 150 separate orders on that docket. And I do want to just um, echo what Judge Martinez Jones mentioned about some of the really good things that we're seeing in this thing. I am seeing better lawyering now than I saw in the courtroom. I'm seeing lawyers not be as lazy, and I hate to say that about my lawyers, I think the world of them, they're amazing, but I'm seeing them think outside the box, prepare for the hearing, be able to write concisely what they want from the court to resolve the dispute. So I'm, what I'm seeing from our lawyers is they're coming to the court with a problem, with a conflict, but they're also coming to the court with not one resolution to that conflict, but an alternative, and if not that judge, another one, and they're having to write it out. And that is pretty um, impressive to me uh, from our lawyers. So I think uh, just as when you expect a lot from your own child or from others that you work for, you typically get a lot back from your coworkers. If you expect high quality work, you get it back. Um, so that is some of the real positive things. I wanted to kind of give them a little bit, Judge, if you don't mind, on the mechanics of our email, just yeah. a little bit and then pop into Zoom because I know that that's kind of like the elephant in the living room of everybody's kind of fearful of that. But so you understand, um, Tuesday, 30 cases on my docket. My docket day is Tuesday, Judge Martinez's docket day is uh, Wednesday. And when we talk docket days, we're talking about our statutory review dockets, our initial status hearing, our permanency hearings, those types of things. So in advance of that hearing, like the week before on Friday, we know what my docket's gonna be on Tuesday. A member of my staff puts together an email in a separate email bucket, and, and it's horrible that I call it this, it's called COVID-126. Um, and who is on that email exchange is myself, my executive uh, assistant uh, who creates the emails, um, our data person that manages things, my court reporter, uh, and uh, Judge Martinez Jones and I, and, and I'm sorry that many of you don't have these things, but I have a staff attorney, she's incredible, and no, I don't want you to hire um, if she's incredible. But, um, so those people are on this email. They're all identified as COVID-126. An email goes out the week before that says, welcome everybody, you're in, the e you're in the starting point of the email hearing for this case, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and in the email subject line, we have the cause number, we have uh, the NRA, Smith, uh, and the date of the hearing. And then we create a subfile for everything on May 15th. And so when I go to that subfile, there are 30 separate matters. And when the emails start coming in, we file them into the proper subfile. And then when it's my time to start ruling on something, I have all of those emails in one vessel and I start going through those emails. It's incumbent on lawyers, if they know that a lawyer has substituted out for someone and we send it to the wrong one, it's incumbent on the first recipients of the email to start cleaning it up with co-counsels, with CASA volunteers or the like that we don't know their names. Um, and typically by one o'clock on the day of my docket, my email closes. That's the deadline by which the time your email needs to be in there. And I start issuing rulings. I will tell you that on a 30 docket day case, um, by the time I get to one o'clock, I would say 75 to 80% of those matters, the parties have reached an agreement 
And so all I have to say is the court orders your agreement. I grant those agreements. A tender an order that comports with this ruling. I will file that, I will sign it, file it a record, and then this email string that we've created, I send that to my clerk, uh, the clerk of the court, and ask that she files that. And I do all that electronically. Doesn't take much time. So then I'm really only dealing with 15 to 20 percent of the email traffic in a conflict uh, type of way. Some of those cases, they'll say, Judge, we really can't do this conflict via email. Can you set me on Zoom? And I typically know that by early morning. And so in that very same day, I am sending out email notifications of a Zoom invitation for that particular case. So by the time I put myself away from my virtual uh, office uh, at five o'clock, all rulings are out on 30 cases and I'm ready to go tomorrow. So Judge Martinez Jones, anything on that? Yours is a little bit different, but the mechanics are mostly the same. Right, the um, way my docket works is pretty much the same. There's a slight difference in how the email is generated. My uh, prosecutors for the agency have asked that they start the email. So they start their emails for their cases. And uh, usually starting a Tuesday for my Wednesday docket, they let me know in individual emails, the same exact way that Judge Byrne has um, for hers, that uh, this case is resolved with agreement. We don't need anything except our next court date. Um, or if they do know that they need to um, be on Zoom in order to resolve some complicated issues, they'll request that usually the day before so that I can get them set in time for Wednesday. Um, and they have told me that what they do is they have a separate email chain with all of the parties where they kind of go back and forth with each other and maybe have some of the more informal uh, discussion about the cases to be able to consolidate that all into one email to me saying, these are the issues that are not resolved and need a ruling. We're happy for you to do it by submission, or we need to be on Zoom, or we have all agreements and we just need the next court date, which is really nice for me to be receiving just the one email um, from all of the parties that have kind of been collective as opposed to um, uh, having all the replies. But that's for my dockets with um, conservatorship. We do have uh, court ordered services as well in our jurisdiction where um, parents maintain their legal rights, but we do have some court oversight on those cases just because of the um, work power from my prosecutors. I only have one prosecutor on that docket. I do generate those emails and they pretty much go just like Judge Burns said, um, but it's nice to have um, that be minimal in the primary uh, cases that involve the conservatorship, the custody to the state um, being done primarily through the prosecutors. And my understanding is what they're doing is circulating the proposed orders to all the parties ahead of time. And that's where they're really doing doing the good lawyer work where they're reading the actual order and they're letting us know if they have a dispute with something in the language or something that's being ordered. And uh, be worked out in a thoughtful way. And I, I can't um, go without also saying one of the electronic benefits that we have is all of our court uh, documents are available to us electronically too. So I'm able to see the entire court file electronically. So when I go into a contested hearing via Zoom, I've got, I've got a separate screen up and on that screen I have my Zoom admonitions and we can talk about that in just a moment. I have, we use the electronic toolbox. Many of you might be using Dropbox to um, drop our exhibits in. So I have that up for a particular hearing just in case we're gonna uh, share, utilize the share function in the Zoom uh, to show exhibits while we're going through contested uh, testimony. I also have up on my, uh, my, mon my side monitor uh, the electronic court file so that if I'm having to take judicial notice of a relinquishment or a death, a suggestion of death or the like, I can actually see that on um, my monitor as we're going through the hearing. If I need to ensure that proof of service has occurred, I've got all that available. So that electronic um, uh, filing system that our clerk has developed years before uh, and our county has, 
also assist in uh, allowing us to move forward uh, totally in a virtual setting. Anything about those kind of tools, Judge, before we launch off into Zoom? I think uh, having an array of those things is what is um, really helpful. It, not one tool or platform does everything. And so being open to using all of those different options. Um, I'll mention that I, uh, our county does have the Microsoft Teams as well. And I've been using that to keep my administrative staff uh, on the same page. We've been sharing spreadsheets um, in order to keep track of all of our hearings and which orders I've signed, which ones we're missing. And that has been very helpful. And I think honestly, that's something we're going to continue to use in the future. Absolutely. Chasing down orders is a big post docket event. Um, but I, I, I'll kind of just leap off. I see that we're at 1235 and we've got about 25 minutes. We do have the chat function of up. If you have any questions, feel free to type them into chat because I'm sure we're not uh, hitting everything. This is really a high level um, presentation. Um, but with regard to Zoom, folks, I'm 60 years old. I am not a millennial. Uh, Judge Martinez Jones is a millennial and she knows <laughs> all the bells and whistles. She's just fearless. Uh, and so, I, you know, but I I can't let her one up me, although she does all the time. Um, <laughs> I <don't think> so. <laughs> so I'm, I'm like, okay, I have got to figure this thing out. I've got to really get nimble with Zoom. One of the things that was beneficial in the state of Texas, and I know that uh, many of you use WebNext and a variety of other tools, but I think it's applicable regardless of what tool you use. Our state office of court administration foresaw the need to buy every court in our state a um, Zoom license. In addition, every court in our state has got a YouTube channel. And you can go on our Office of Court Administration and you can see what the state of Texas judges have been doing on YouTube for you know, the last several months. Um, I do not myself simultaneously broadcast my CPS cases. Um, I, in opening statement with my attorneys, I asked them if they believed that it would be appropriate for open, um, open courts that we simultaneously broadcast this via YouTube. I'm happy to take your argument in opening statement and I'll assess that. But in light of some of the very sensitive issues related to the children and families that we serve, the HIPAA issues, the drug use issues, the abuse issues. I typically only use Zoom and I broadcast, and again, I, I, got, I took this from Judge Jones, I simply broadcast my docket for the week on my YouTube channel. So anyone in the state of Texas or in the world really can go to my YouTube channel and see what cases I am presiding over this week. And then I do it one at a time, as it relates to a Zoom hearing, if I'm gonna broadcast that simultaneously. So far, I've broadcast none, nor has anyone asked that I do that. But we send out our invitation. Uh, I, you know, If it's on the docket day, if the, this case is on a 30 uh, case docket today, I'm gonna make every effort to resolve every one of those cases on that day and get the Zoom notice out. I think I've only had at most maybe five or six Zoom hearings in a day, um, 30, 20 minutes, an hour, things of that nature. But for example, this morning I had a three hour Zoom hearing. Tomorrow I'll have a three hour Zoom hearing. Friday I'll have a five hour Zoom hearing. Um, but most of the time they're an hour or less. Um, we get out the notice. You can configure your waiting room to be personal to your court, and that's in your Zoom settings. You can go and edit your waiting room. So my waiting room has got the picture of my courtroom door, um, and it gives instructions to the individuals waiting that uh, correlates with the invocation of the rule and asks them to stand by in the waiting room until it's time for them to come into the hearing. Some of the things that I do to keep control and decorum, obviously my virtual background is a decorum thing. 
I rarely wear my robe during my hearings. I did one time, and that was because I was dealing with a very uh, difficult litigant, and I felt need to have the symbol of that robe to distinguish me from many of the others on the court uh, hearing. If you know nothing else of what to do, know how to mute people, know how to put people back in the waiting room. If they become unruly, you can put them back in the waiting room and they have to wait there until you're ready to pull them out. I had that situation this morning where I had a gentleman that kept interrupting the proceeding and I gave him one last warning. I'm gonna put you in the waiting room if you do this one more time and then I'll develop a breakout room so that your lawyer can go into a meeting with you and advise you that I can kick you out of this hearing if you choose to continue to be disruptive. And after I bring the lawyer back in, I will get confirmation that she's advised her client and then I can bring the client back in. Um, there are things that you can set up in your profile, with your Zoom account, that can kick somebody out 100%. If you remove them from a hearing, they cannot come back in. You can turn that on or off, and I've only done that once um, in that really challenging hearing that I told you I wore the robe. Um, and in that instance, what we had to do after the litigant finally figured out a way to control and monitor their behavior was I had to issue a brand new invite to everybody on the call, including that person that I removed. We shut the whole hearing down and then everybody re-upped into the hearing again. So there are knowing how to use your mute button, knowing how to use your waiting room, knowing how to use breakout rooms. And Zoom has got a ton of wonderful training tools, online videos that you can utilize. I practice with my family. My husband has been on a Zoom call and he fake hearing with me, my daughter, my son-in-law, and we practice. Um, so, um, so I would encourage you to get uh, familiar with the tools. Judge Martinez Jones, you do it a lot more swiftly than me. So I know you've got a lot of tools. Sure, and I'll say my camera doesn't do virtual backgrounds so without a green screen, and I, I just couldn't invest in a green screen. I just wouldn't know what else I would do with it. But I've just set up my background to look as uh, judicial as possible. That's the flag that I hang above my garage on 4th of July, but it's in my bedroom now where I'm having my hearings. So um, I've done my best to do my background in the same way. Also, uh, don't wear my robe. I try and wear black or colors that are not distracting. One of the other things I would mention is you can change your name on Zoom and it's beneficial to put judge in front of it so that people can clearly see who you are. You can see both myself and Judge Byrne have that on our um, profiles and it's a very easy thing to be able to change. Um, at the beginning of my Zooms, I also identify myself, especially on those new hearings and, and I let them know my name. I'm Judge Aurora Martinez-Jones and I'm presiding over this hearing. I'll be your judge and go into the other admonishments. Um, Knowing your tools is very, very important. Um, I think what Judge Byrne said is exactly correct. I have um, staff that I make a co-host and that enables them to also, and I call it mute patrol, my staff will be on mute patrol and will mute people if they are continuing to do that, if I need to give them the admonishments. So that's something you may consider if you do have staff who will be joining, um, that they have those abilities to help you control the virtual courtroom because it is very important and it becomes problematic in the amount of time that's spent managing those difficulties that are things that have not been the same. I don't have a deputy who could step up a couple of steps closer to council table and get everybody to calm down. We don't have that right now. Um, and client control is very difficult for um, lawyers over Zoom. I've advised my um, attorneys to practice with their clients on Zoom ahead of time so that they know, one, that they can log on, that they're not gonna have technical difficulties, that their clients know how to use it. And I also um, mentioned to them, because I know even the um, 
the agency has some difficulty sometimes with our caseworkers communicating with the prosecutors that they have another method to communicate. There is the chat function, and um, if you go to the bottom of your screen, you'll see as you scroll over it, some options pop up. That's where a lot of your features will be. And there's one that says chat. You can click on that and your box will come up. It should usually come up to your right, depending on how you look at it. And um, down at the bottom, you can type a message. Uh, in the to section, it tells you if you want that message to go to everyone or if you want it to go to a person privately. Um, as a host, it also allows you to send a message to people in certain breakout rooms. So you can send them a message even though you don't hear or see them when you put them in a def different breakout room. You can send them a message so that they know you're about to end their breakout or you're about to bring them back into the main room. You can also send messages to people in the waiting room. So if the hearing is taking a little bit longer, I had witnesses the other day, some police officers, and uh, we actually didn't need them. So I sent them a message, letting them, thanking them, first of all, and then letting them be excused so that they could log off and, and continue doing whatever work they needed to since we didn't need their testimony. So being able to utilize those features and understanding how they work, but there's caution to that as well. Because when you have that feature on, it's very difficult to manage it and control it and it's something where it's either on or it's off and so if it's on you also have the potential which has happened to me for uh, ex parte communication I had a parent who was sending just me direct messages I had to stop our hearing and read out everything that was in the chat those chats, just so everybody knows, also can be downloaded, and that's something that the host can do, not just anybody, only the host. Um, and if they are downloaded, the private chats get downloaded as well. So I let our lawyers know that in case they want to discuss anything that could be attorney-client privilege, that perhaps they're on a separate method of communication with their client and not necessarily doing that in the group chats. I personally do not download those chats, but in the instance where I had a parent who did that ex parte communication, I felt that it was prudent that everybody was aware of what that was, and, and that's a situation where we would have to do that. So that's something to be mindful of as far as utilizing all of the tools. Um, if you are the host, you can go to the top of a screen um, for any video box that there is, and you'll see three little blue dots, and that drops down additional features. That's where you remove people. That's where you put them back in the waiting room that's where you can spotlight them which is what this is with me as the main uh, video um, and that's where you can do all the the features that you need to do right now what you can do I think is just pin a video which kind of freezes it in its spot um, if you're not the host but that's another feature that's very important I use this spotlight feature for my family drug court when I'm having those one-on-one -on -one, um, conversations with the participants in the drug court I do have the whole team on just like this but when I'm having that conversation with the participants I'll highlight myself when I'm speaking. I'll highlight the participant when they're speaking so that it does feel more like a one-on-one -on -one conversation between me and the participant, which is normally how it is in our family drug court program. So there's a lot of things you can do to make, um, make the feel flow like it would in court, but it takes a lot longer. Um, anything that you get as far as a time announcement, I would consider it's gonna take a little bit longer. It's inevitable that there's some technical difficulties. It's inevitable that somebody's internet connection crashes in the middle of, we had yesterday, the examination of their witness. Um, and in those cases, you just have to be prepared to uh, roll with what your options are. Sometimes your options are, you know, off the record, let's give them a few minutes, can someone send them a text message. Sometimes it says Judge Byrne said and you have to start a brand new um, Zoom session and create a new invite to get everybody on. Um, sometimes it's everybody log off and everybody log back on. And I'll say, especially at uh, the beginning of doing this, there have been times that Zoom uh, just didn't function right. I think it's just high capacity times and you've got to just be prepared that that may happen. I was told Zoom is busy. Please try again later. And I was like, oh my goodness, I've got five hearings set. Don't tell me this, please. Um, but that has happened before. Uh, we struggle sometimes because all of our um, parents don't have stable technology or internet connections. So we make sure that they also have the call-in number. Um, it is possible to participate in Zoom just by phone. They can call in and use the meeting ID. 
when you do the settings for your Zoom, you can have passwords if you um, need that extra level of security. Um, but those are all things that you can tailor and coordinate to assure that your hearings run in the way that makes the most sense for you and your court. Um, I think that's my rundown, Judge Byrne, if you had anything else. Sure. I saw that there's a question in the chat about recording. I will be happy to send my Zoom admonitions. Uh, in my Zoom, I, uh, my court reporter is uh, seen in one of the you know, Hollywood squares. I introduce everyone that's in my staff. I literally introduce everyone that uh, is in my staff observing or participating. I instruct people to watch my official court reporter. I actually issue an order in my admonishments that uh, everyone is ordered not to record this proceeding. There is only one official record of this proceeding, and that would be from the court reporter. And I ask them to watch her Hollywood Square, because if she does this, that means she's not getting a clear record. And I'm going to be watching her square, and I'm asking everyone else to watch her square so that we can get a clear record. So in my admonitions at the very beginning, we talk about issues such as uh, documents in a witness's lap. Uh, that's a no-no. Uh, you are to testify from your memory, and you are only to utilize documents that are admitted into evidence or alternatively um, being used uh, after proper evidentiary foundation is laid uh, to refresh the witness's memory. So you can get a lot of that done through your Zoom admonitions. For my hearing on Friday, what I have done is I have, I have turned my Zoom admonitions into an actual court order that I am filing in that court file, sending ahead of the hearing to all the parties so that it's incumbent upon them to have read those admonitions in advance so I don't have to spend 15 minutes or 10 minutes getting the hearing set up, doing the admonitions, but that it's already out there about the record, uh, only testifying from your memory, um, not talking over each other, uh, how I can set up a breakout room. Um, and for my hearing on Friday, again, in order to assist the interpreters that are gonna be working very hard for this hearing, I ordered that my opening statements be tendered to me a day ahead of time. That allows me to align the parties without having to spend all the time in an opening statement and having to interpret opening statements. So get those ahead of time, a day ahead of time. In addition, we, uh, in this order, they're ordered to tender their written exhibits or the audio exhibits or photo uh, exhibits in advance, a minimum of a day, to the court reporter. And then she places those exhibits in a joint file folder in box and sends a notice to all parties that for the hearing tomorrow, um, this is your invite to look at the exhibits that are in the box uh, file folder so you can prepare your objections. So we utilize that tool as well, but these admonishments are helpful as it relates to recording. And you know, how do you know that an individual doesn't have notes in their lap? How do you know they're not recording? Well, take yourself back to a day in court when your court audience was filled with 30 or 40 people. You have no idea whether they were recording that hearing via their cell phone. Um, so, we're dealing with some of the exact same risks in this virtual format that we deal with in the courtroom. I would say some of the, you know, some of the challenging things. I had a hearing this morning involving a mom of six children, and it had some really um, graphic testimony about domestic violence uh, in that particular record. And I know her three-year-old, her four-year-old, her seven-year-old, her 14-year-old, was within earshot. Um, I mean, the mom was uh, incredibly poised, but there was a point in time where the children's background noise uh, interrupted. 
um, you know, private conversations with a child uh, and the judge is hard to ensure that it's private um, because that child may have residential treatment staff nearby. They may have a mom nearby. You're going to be dealing with risk, um, but we dealt with them live in court. Um, it's just different risk. And so we can't, um, we have to acknowledge that they exist and try to care for them, um, but, but go ahead and move forward. I will tell you, based on what Judge Martinez Jones said related to the chat function, I actually turn the chat function off and I notify people in my admonitions, it's off. No one can chat. If you need the chat function to upload a uh, written document, uh, you can, you can uh, upload an exhibit through the chat function. You have to ask my permission to do so. If you need a breakout room, you have to ask my permission to have a breakout room and then I'll develop one for you if I find it necessary. On the written exhibits, um, I am the one that controls the share function. I don't allow my litigants to utilize the share function. I do it for them from the box um, so that there is some uh, sense of control. So as the host, you do have a lot of tools at your disposal, but it is important to know how to use them or have at least as just Martinez Jones mentioned, have one of your staff members learn how to use all those functions and do that for you uh, in the hearing. I just, I find myself to be more nimble and I don't want to rely on a non-lawyer to know when a witness um, should no longer be able to speak. Uh, I want to be the one that shuts that down and if it it makes an appellate point, then it makes an appellate point. Um, so it is one of those things that um, the more you know how to use the tool and more nimble you are with the tool, the better. And again, I, I, um, I tell you that I have done so many Zoom trainings and they're, they're really very good. Anything further, just Martinez Jones? Now, I think just to follow up with what you said, coordination and planning is really the key to making sure the Zoom hearings are successful. Um, having them do all of the um, opening statements ahead of time. Narrowing the scope is also something that's very helpful so that everybody knows the very specific issues that we're dealing with and we're not kind of all over the place. Sometimes that would happen when we were in person and in court. And then also coordinating the um, exhibits with everybody knowing what's going to be ahead of time. Um, the court being able to handle the share screen is also something that I do um, just to make sure that we don't have any problems. Sometimes people share the wrong thing and then that goes in a different direction. Um, but it is a feature that you can use and I will show you guys that whatever you have that you want to share, you can um, bring up and then that will be shared with everybody else. So you can see I brought up the NCJFCJ website about this hearing. It's something that everybody will see and then as uh, the person sharing, you decide when that share stops. And so um, having the capacity to do that is very important and you don't want to just allow that to anybody. Again, at the bottom of your screen when those um, different prompts come up, as the host, you can determine whether or not people can um, share their screen and manage that control down there. Um, but I think that we've pretty much covered the basics. There's, um, like Judge Byrne said, a lot of different features. The Zoom trainings are really great, but I think the best way to learn is, as Judge Byrne said, actually doing it, practicing it, trying it. Before I got started, I had just some um, Zoom meetings set up and invited different professionals. I gave them a couple of different times to just get a feel for it because not only do I have to learn it, but they have to learn it too. So I set up just a Zoom with prosecutors, a Zoom with my uh, CASAs and, and caseworkers, anybody who wanted to just get on and get the feel for it. I set up a few of those before we actually got started just to give everybody that opportunity to get a feel for it and look at all of the features. And, and that I think was really helpful in getting everybody onboarded in a, a sufficient time. Um, also, the interpreter function is amazing. I have had a French case. I've had a Pashti case. Uh, I'm going to have a deaf case this week. So 
Um, it can also accommodate interpreters, but that's probably for another day. Um, I know that we are at 1259 and I don't want to um, uh, outstay our, our welcome. And so I don't know whether Mark wishes to close us out. Hello, yes. Thank you very much. Both of you uh, re really appreciate the information. Uh, and um, Judge Byrne and Judge Martinez Jones are uh, very much part of the council, and we appreciate your input and your insight and your leadership uh, on these and many other issues. So, um, some of you have uh, sent directly uh, a request for the Zoom admonitions. We'll uh, try to follow up and get those to you. Uh, I've put my email in the uh, chat box. If you don't see those for some reason, um, we will follow up on those. So we would like to thank everyone for coming today, and um, we just um, wish you wish you a good day and a good week, and hope everybody uh, stays safe. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, y'all. Bye.